welcome John and Chris to the S4 main stage. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John. Chris. And uh, we are here to, uh, to talk to you about a, a methodology called CyberPHA that has been used uh, quite successfully to help companies um, assess the cyber risk to their industrial control systems. Uh, it's based on some, uh, a lot of work from the, uh, from the ISA standards and the NIST standards, uh, but it's unique in many ways in that it's a uh, it's very uh, application-oriented process, and it ties very much into to well-established process safety processes. So very happy to be here. It's actually my first uh, S4, uh, though I don't know why, because I've been in this field for, for about nine years, and I don't know why I haven't come to Miami in January before, but it definitely will not be my last. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk about this, this process. We've already been introduced, so we're going to skip these slides. And what we want to get across here is, is how these risk assessments can be part of an overall cybersecurity program and how they can tie into, particularly in industries that, that have uh, hazardous processes, how it can tie into established process safety methodologies and the impact uh, of, of cyber, potential impact of cyber on safety and helping understand that how it ties into the, to the well-established standards that are already out there. Uh, and then we'll go through, uh, I'll quickly go through the process itself, the methodology, uh, through a quick example. And then Chris will talk about lessons learned uh, as, as, as he has applied this as a, as a significant part of his program. So again, very happy to be here. Um, uh, kind of incidentally here by way of Alaska because uh, that's where Dale and I, uh, I ran into Dale in October in Alaska, we were uh, working at the same client, and I was facilitating one of these uh, cyber PHAs. And, uh, and Dale said, uh, you know, you, this is something the industry needs to know more about, please, so please come to S4 and talk about it. So that's why we're here. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so as John mentioned, um, with your products and chemicals and uh, um, Based on all the uh, increased um, risk and changing landscape for the uh, ICS uh, cyber, my company decided that they needed to have somebody spend full time uh, dedicated to uh, working on, on, on cyber and trying to protect our plants. Um, as also mentioned, uh, my company has a very wide footprint. I have over 600 plants or facilities worldwide. So uh, it's quite a challenge to uh, try to address all that. So. As part of that, um, uh, when I got assigned this role, I decided to go out and figure out, okay, what are the questions that I really need to answer to try to address the space and make sure that um, I, we have um, success at my company? And so as I canvass some of my stakeholders, uh, these are some of the questions that they ask. Um, is my plan system, ICS system, is it uh, secure from a cyber attack? Um, has the system been compromised already? Uh, from management of change perspective, if I make a change to my system, will that change affect the security of my system? Will it make it less secure? Also, from a firewall perspective, uh, as soon as you start talking cyber, everybody says, well, just stick a firewall on it. But, you know, what type of firewall? How many types, how many uh, firewalls do I need for a particular process? Uh, trying to understand that, you know, do, do I need to have, you know, DPI? Do I need to have um, IDS? What do we really need from a firewall perspective? And what rules do I need to have configured in these firewalls? Amazingly enough, uh, we find a lot of firewalls who are configured as permit any any. Um, so having a firewall there is just not, not good enough. The last two questions, though, really get at uh, why we need a, a, a PHA and why the PHA really adds a lot of value from a cyber perspective. And that is, how do you know when we've spent enough? How good is, is good enough? I don't want to spend any more than I really have to um, to secure my plants. And without a, uh, a PHA, um, that answer is not quite uh, forthcoming. So cyber is really all about risk management. Is that something that the light bulb went off in my head um, you know, once I really got into and understood what, what cyber is all about? So in order to uh, address cyber, um, you know, one must really understand um, risk um, because, again, cyber is about risk management. 
So one of the first things you need to do when you're trying to assess your risk is understand what it is you're trying to protect, okay? Uh, so uh, first thing to do is to go out there and really um, identify what your critical assets are. You know, what is it you're trying to protect? Inventory those assets, and, and then maybe you might want to classify these assets um, in terms of possibly, you know, what, what's the consequence of one failing. Then you really need to understand what are the realistic threats. Your whole design will be based on what you consider to be a realistic threat. And also, you might want to understand also what the probability or likelihood of that threat being realized is and what the consequences may be. Um, identifying existing vulnerabilities and the consequence of a compromise is, is uh, really important. Um, are we talking about just loss of visibility? Are we talking about loss of control of our, of our systems and our assets? Are we talking about potentially equipment damage, product interruption? Um, or even injury or, or possibly fatalities. Um, so it's really important to understand what the consequences of a compromise is. Once you've done it, you really need to assess are your current safeguards appropriate for the risk that um, you have. Uh, once that is understood, it then leads you to understand what your residual risk is. So after this risk assessment and you understand what your gaps are and what your residual risk in your process is, then you can begin to understand what is a, a comprehensive plan and start develop that comprehensive plan to address cyber risk at your companies. Um, and that could include, um, in addition to your existing countermeasures, what additional measures are required. Um, from that, uh, that could also, that's not just the technology, that may also include modifications to your existing work processes, your policies and procedures. Um, and then the final two points are, and this is, will really help you when you start to put together your plan because uh, we all have limited resources and you really want to expend your resources where it's really going to make the most difference. So um, coming out of a PHA, you might have, you know, 500 recommendations. We can't do all of them, so you got to figure out which, where is going to be the most important one. So prioritizing those recommendations and then evaluating them uh, for cost versus complexity is, is a really important step. And uh, finally, before I turn over to John, just wanted to mention uh, risk assessments are, are really important, but really they're only one component of a comprehensive uh, cybersecurity um, plan and program. And so, again, you know, um, John's going to talk more about that, but recognize that if you don't have a comprehensive program, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of success. So, what I want to talk about now is, is the actual the cyber PHA process. But in order to do that, I want to take a little bit of a step back and talk about a little bit about the origins of the process and how it ties in with existing uh, standards and best practices. So everybody here, I'm sure, is very familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework and, um, and the, uh, the identify function, which has under that a subcategory, uh, a category of risk assessment. But I think if you ask 10 people uh, what a risk assessment is, particularly in a, for a control system, you'd probably get 10 different answers uh, because there's not a lot of standardization in, in, in the area of how to perform these assessments. What the NIST framework does, as, as any good framework should, is it, it establishes some baselines, some base uh, requirements or recommendations. And those tie in this slide uh, directly then to, or, or reference, different existing industry standards. The ones that I have highlighted are the ISA 99 or 6443 references, because that's relevant to ICS. There are other ones, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, that the standard that the framework references uh, that are generally more IT-centric uh, risk assessment methodologies. So there's a lot of different ways to perform a risk assessment. Um, so I'm going to focus, of course, on this uh, cyber PHA methodology and how it ties, uh, particularly ties to the ISA 62443 series of standards. So if you look at those references from, from NIST more directly, it ties to the to to these requirements in the 2-1 standard, which basically says pick a risk assessment met methodology, um, conduct a high-level risk assessment, identify your control systems, make sure you understand them, have uh, network diagrams, prioritize them, 
then perform detailed vulnerability and risk assessments, and then figure out how often you're gonna do those and document the results, of course. What it does not talk about is how to perform the risk assessment. That's um, still yet to come, but I'll talk about that in a moment, um, uh, where ISA is going with the, uh, with, in terms of uh, helping users um, with the actual methodology. But PHA, the term that Chris and I have thrown out a couple times now, uh, it stands for process hazard analysis. And the reason this, this process or this methodology has been given that name is because PHAs are, are very well established risk management methodology in the continuous process industries, particularly in oil and gas and chemical and other hazardous industries with hazardous processes. So uh, this is a cybersecurity conference, so just make sure everybody is aware of process safety. It's basically the prevention of bad things happening in industrial facilities like fires, explosions, uh, releases of, of chemicals or gases and so on. Uh, that could impact, particularly that could impact health and safety. Though most process safety programs also extend to looking at financial and other impacts to the organization. And one of the key premises of process safety is this concept of layers of protection. That you want to have multi, the more, uh, the higher the risk, uh, or the higher the consequences, the more layers of protection you need to prevent uh, an incident, or if there is an incident, to contain it, to mitigate it. So this is a fairly common diagram that you see in, in discussions about process safety, explaining this idea of layers of protection. And in modern systems, we have control systems and safety systems and uh, other layers of protection to prevent uh, incidents. And then the PHA process, it's been around for decades. Uh, it's a very organized, systematic approach to identifying these process hazards and understanding the, the risk associated with them. How likely are they to occur? How bad would they be if, if, if they happened? The basic, the basic formula for risk, which is uh, likelihood times consequence. Been used for decades, and the focus is on the equipment, <coughs> the instrumentation, the utilities, human actions, other external factors. And uh, for many industries, this, this is regulated. If, uh, if, if you fall under OSHA, PSM, or uh, uh, e, um, EPA's RMP program, or some of the offshore and pipeline sectors, uh, are required to do some level of process hazard analysis, or process safety management, or process safety, or pipeline safety management program. So it's been around for a long time, well accepted by, op by uh, operations groups as part of an ongoing risk management and safety program. And there's two basic types of studies that are done, HAZOPS and LOPAs. HAZOPS identify the hazards, and um, it, it, it's a qu quantitative methodology. Layer protection analysis is more quantitative, uh, but both of them are answering the questions, what are the potential hazards, and are there sufficient layers of protection to, uh, to, to manage that risk to tolerable levels? Very similar for those of us in cybersecurity when we talk about defense in depth. Layers of protection is, is, is the very same similar concept. Uh, another, another key factor in, in, uh, in any process safety program is usually something called a risk matrix, which is the organization's definition for what is tolerable risk. And it talks about things like health, safety, environmental, company image, for example, and on one scale, the consequences, and then the likelihood on the other scale. And if you'll notice, this is an example, but this is typical of what you find in a risk matrix, is that there are orders of magnitude. So this is not a precise science. What we are trying to, to, to understand here is relative risk and whether that risk is within the company's tolerable guidelines or not. In other words, what things must the company respond to? So a typical HAZOP might look like this. They typically, uh, a HAZOP worksheet might look like this. And, and when we do a HAZOP, we break the process down into units and nodes. And we walk through uh, with operations and engineering and other folks to talk about what are the potential hazards, what could go wrong, what are the deviations, how could that happen, what are the causes, most importantly, what are the consequences and how bad could they be, and they get scored uh, according to that risk matrix. And that gives us our, our initial risk, and then we look at, so, okay, so what safeguards do we have in place to prevent that? What layers of protection do we have uh, to prevent that? And so what is our, what is our, uh, our mitigated risk? And then oftentimes, these are followed up 
particularly for, for particularly hazardous uh, threat scenarios, we, we do a deeper dive in safety called the LOPA, layer protection analysis, to look more deeply at are, what are those layers of protection, are they truly independent, and how good are they? Unfortunately, one of the drawbacks, this is a very mature, established process, but one of the drawbacks is it, it does not take into account, it was never designed to take into account deliberate actions. Uh, and and uh, so cyber events, for example, or, or even really take into account the likelihood or the probability of a control system not doing what it's supposed to do. They kind of assume that it's going to perform its function, that the alarm is going to go off, that the safety system is going to take action. Um, so one of the challenges we face, particularly now with modern control systems, is that uh, they're intelligent, programmable, and, um, and they're integrated. And it's possible that a single vulnerability could disable multiple layers of protection. So we have to study that because there's a lot of other factors involved that could, uh, and other safeguards in place that, that can protect the system. Non-programmable, non-cyber. Um, uh, so these studies, unfortunately the HAZUP and LOPA studies don't take that into account, but if we extend the process through what we call the cyber PHA, we can take into account the cyber um, risk and, and see if that then is, is tolerable or and address things that are not. So to help visualize that, going back to my earlier diagram, we've got the basic control system and we've got the safety system, um, but in reality today, those are oftentimes networked together. And uh, common HMIs, common engineering workstations, common networks, uh, so it's possible that a single uh, a threat actor could potentially uh, attack both the control and the safety system and either initiating an, an event or prevent a safety uh, action from, from, uh, from bringing the process to a safe state. The uh, safety standards have also recognized this. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of standards in safety. Uh, IEC 61511 is, is the predominant one for functional safety and the latest version of that does recognize now that a security risk assessment needs to be carried out because safety assessments are limited to looking at, usually at random failures or systematic failures, but not cyber and not deliberate. Uh, so the design of the safety systems now need to provide uh, resilience against cyber threats as well. And then it points to guidance from two different sources, TR84, uh, a tech report from the S84 committee, and 62443-3-2. So 3-2 is, a, is a, uh, a standard under development, but uh, pretty close to being, uh, it's going out for, for ballot, that talks about the process of how to, finally answering the question, how does one perform a, an industrial control system cybersecurity risk assessment? And it presents, presents a, a framework for doing that. It tries not to be too prescriptive, but provides a framework for how one might perform such an assessment. So w I want to quickly walk through an example for you so you can see, rather than go through that flowchart, the, the basic idea is very much like a PHA. In PHA, we start out with PNIDs as our drawings, and we break the process into um, units and nodes, and we walk through systematically. We do the same thing in a cyber PHA, except that our, our, our drawings are the network architecture drawings. So we start with a system architecture, of the control system all the way from level zero up to level four, and we break it down into units, um, sites, units, and zones, and nodes. And we can walk through the system very systematically and look at what are the different threats. Um, so this, this uh, worksheet is a PH cyber PHA worksheet. Have you not surprisingly, it looks an awful lot like a HAZOP, and it's based on that methodology that's been, as I said, very well accepted in operations um, as a way to systematically walk through the system. But in this case, our zones, our control system zones, our, our nodes, our control system components, and our, our, our deviations or our threats are different. Instead of, uh, for example, a, uh, a valve malfunctioning, our deviations are a control system fails to perform its, its expected function, for example. So I give a, a simple example here, uh, but the idea is we walk through and we, we identify the, what could go wrong, which are the, the, uh, the deviation, uh, what are the causes, these are the, th the threat actions, what are the consequences, which 
need to be pers- uh, use the same language as you would use in any other risk assessment. What's, what's the impact to the organization if this happens? And we quantify that using the same risk matrix so that we're, we're, so we're comparing apples to apples in terms of risk. We're not trying to use a different scale for cyber risk. Risk is risk, particularly to management. Uh, it's all about health, safety, financial, and other impacts to the organization. And then we identify what's the initial risk Uh, And very much like a HAZOP, we then look at, okay, what countermeasures do we already have in place? This would be our existing layers of protection or existing defense in depth. And how good are they? Are they good enough uh, against different types of threats and different types of attacks? And then we we, uh, identify, then what is the residual risk? Taking into account the existing safeguards, what's the residual risk and what can we do about it? as I said, it's, it's, it's a very systematic approach. It really encourages the team to come together, a cross-disciplinary team to come together and think about all of these different aspects. Um, actually, a lot of, of cross-learning takes place during these because, because it, it encourages discussion about these different threat scenarios and encourages discussions about how realistic they are. And you know, if well facilitated, you can make sure that they don't go off on, on, on down rabbit holes, uh, but uh, stay focused on the task of, of really understanding the process and the, the, the cyber risks and being able to answer those questions to management about why are we recommending this and why aren't we recommending this? Um, because the, the, uh, without an approach like this, um, you're, you, you have a couple of choices. You can just apply all of the best standards and practices and all the different technology that's out there, but nobody can afford that. And it would likely be overkill and actually could interrupt, cause more problems. Uh, so the, the idea of this process is to go through and really understand where, which vulnerabilities can lead to the highest risks. And then you can focus on shoring up those vulnerabilities or closing those holes. So I said it uses the same risk matrix and then one of the outcomes, there's, there's several outcomes, and one of the outcomes usually would be a, a, a properly uh, a, a zoned system with, with the appropriate barriers uh, of protection at the different zone boundaries. Uh, but that, not to say that that's the only mitigation, but that is one of, one of many outcomes. And turn it back to Chris to, uh, to kind of wrap up the session here. Thanks, John. Um, as John said, this process uh, really works. Um, it is um, it's, it's a pretty intensive process, but the results coming out of there are, are, are normally fantastic, and they give you a real basis for really um, doing your system design. Actually, after the fact, um, I have implemented a system, this process on, on numbers of, of my, uh, my plants, and one of the things I found long after the fact is that as you know, sometimes your project manager or your project engineer uh, will come back and challenge, you know, why am I spending uh, all this, this, this money on, on these particular um, uh, technology? And this is actually a documented basis that we go back to and says, here's why we're doing it. And if we don't do this, this is a risk that will be um, left behind. So it actually gives you a very good basis uh, for uh, defending why you're spending what you have to spend on, on cyber. I um, just want to leave you with a couple of um, uh, examples or considerations for uh, a cybersecurity, uh, comprehensive cybersecurity program for, uh, for ICS systems uh, that I've um, had the uh, ability to uh, go through. Uh, first thing is um, assembling uh, a core team. You need to understand within your organization who owns security. And I'm not just talking about at the plant. We're talking about all the systems that are connected to your plants, and all of it needs to be protected. So uh, find out who all your stakeholders are, assemble them together. And also, don't, don't go it alone. Um, you know, while as many of your organizations, if you're like mine, uh, a lot of smart people, and everybody has ideas on how to, how to do things, um, but it's probably best uh, to go with somebody who has actual experience, has gone through this process numbers of times, so find a experienced partner um, who, has, uh, who can not only uh, walk you through the process, but also train you so that your team can, uh, can then um, work uh, somewhat independently uh, going forward. 
Uh, you want to also, you know, develop a common uh, mission and vision uh, for for that team, so that you, you know if your program is going to last multiple years, which it should, um, to keep the team focused around what are the important um, methods by which it's going to function. Uh, you want to start with, you know, an, an as-built um, system. You need to understand what it is that you have, as I mentioned before, that will help you. And consider a phased approach. For me, because I had so many systems out there, uh, I had to figure out how to f um, focus on the most important first. And also, since this uh, Cyber PHA is a pretty intensive program uh, process, you might want to consider doing a high-level uh, vulnerability assessment before you actually get um, deeply into this uh, uh, PHA. Um, use this opportunity as a training opportunity for your teams. Uh, a lot of times you'll find that your IT teams, some of them have never been to a plant, and it's a good uh, opportunity to, to get everybody on the same page, talk the same language, and understand why we're doing what, what you're doing. Um, document your deliverables, and then also remember that you, know, you can put a whole lot of technology in a plant and you can create all these systems, but you might be back doing it again five years or ten years from now because the environment has changed. So think about how you're going to maintain and sustain these systems as you go forward. Um, here are a number of, uh, of deliverables, that, deliverables that, that come out of, uh, of this process. Um, I won't spend any time on them, but just like to uh, you know point out that uh, this is a you know a well-documented process. Um, it's it, you can go methodically through it, and um, you may consider these deliverables when you start to look at trying to put together um, a request for code to work with a um, a consultant uh, who might partner with you. And and finally, in conclusion. Uh, from uh, risk assessments, you know, um, there's a, a lot of good information that you can get out of it. Um, as we, we discussed today, um, you can determine, you know, what plants needs to be addressed first, so you have your priorities all, all decided. Um, you can in intelligently design and apply countermeasures to, to your systems um, to reduce and manage the risks that are, are, are remaining. Um, it also allows you to prioritize your activities and your resources, um, the most important ones first. And then <laughs> you will have an understanding of uh, which countermeasures are going to give you the proverbial most bang for the buck um, and understand which ones will be the, the easiest um, to implement and catch the, the so-called so uh, low-hanging fruit. And then uh, finally, it establishes a, a firm basis uh, for you to make your uh, decisions regards your, your target architecture. Um, we, in, in my company, we, we determine what our target, uh, target architecture is based on um, a lot of this analysis. And then we will go back and we will revisit this um, every couple of years to make sure that um, these systems and uh, the architecture is still valid given the changing uh, conditions um, that are out there, that, um, as we know, uh, the cyber world is not one that, that stays the same. It's always dynamic. And you have to take into consideration um, uh, the fact that it's changing and update and keep your, your defenses updated to protect you against it. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, thank you.